What's the scariest story you've ever heard, real or fake, internet or not? Story 1. It's late. There are three people on a subway train sitting in a row, two men and a woman in the middle. A teenage gal walks on the subway and sits across from the three strangers. The woman in the middle has an expressionless look on her face while the two men are staring directly into the teenager's eyes. Shortly after, a businessman enters the subway and sits next to the teenager. After a few minutes, he pulls out his notepad and writes, Get off the next stop. Trust me. When the next stop comes, the teenager and the businessman get up to exit the cab while the two men verbally try to stop them. When they get off, the man explains to the teenager that the woman in the middle of the two men was dead, and they were after her next. Heard this when I was in seventh grade. Always freaked me out. I mean, creepy if true, I suppose, but that story rates at about a 1.2 out of 10 on the old mainly facts scaredometer, which is slightly scarier than running out of napkins. Story 2. A young girl is playing in her bedroom when she hears her mother call to her from the kitchen, so she runs downstairs to meet her mother. As she's running through the hallway, the door to the cupboard under the stairs opens, and a hand reaches out and pulls her in. It's her mother. She whispers to the child, Don't go into the kitchen. I heard it too. I like this version of the story better, where the mom calls her, and as she's running down the stairs, her mom's voice comes from upstairs and tells her to stop. She heard it too. So the girl is stuck on the stairs, unable to figure out who is really her mother. Yeah, Commenter definitely has the better version of the story going on. However, I like the story more as the original, so far as I know, with the kid, the dad, and there being something under the bed. Story 3. I once had a friend tell me about a girl she knew who met up with a guy she met on some online dating site. They met for dinner, and afterwards he walked her to her car. He kept trying and trying to get her to go home with him. She declined all invites, and eventually they kissed goodnight and went their separate ways. A few days later, she gets some weird bumps on her lips and goes to the doctor. After examining her, the doctor seems legitimately worried and asks her about her most recent romantic encounter, because what she has is some sort of bacteria, or something on her lips that you can only get from a decomposing body. Long, creepy butt story short, an internet guy gets busted with, like, four dead female bodies in his apartment that he had been going down on and freaking with. Could be total BS, but that story creeped me out for weeks. Too long didn't read, girl gets a weird rash from kissing a guy she met online for the first date, turns out he killed a bunch of girls and was freaking their bodies. Story 4. In rural southern Illinois, a toy company began selling realistic baby dolls to expectant mothers. But apparently, after the mother had her child, the toy baby would start crying. Eventually, the rocking motion advertised to calm it down wouldn't work, and you couldn't get it to stop without shaking it. Eventually, when it started crying, the parent would have to beat it, and even then the beating and thrashing would have to get harder and harder to get it to be quiet. The only thing that seemed to shut the baby doll up permanently was to bash its head against the wall to destroy whatever mechanism triggered the crying. On more than one occasion, though, neighbors called the authorities to report child abuse, and when the police arrived, they found the bloody remains of infants smeared across the walls and the floors. In most cases, the mother couldn't understand why the police were there. She said that she had just got rid of the stupid doll. She calmly stated as she rocked a baby-shaped bundle in her arms. That is definitely unsettling as an idea, but also just feels a little far-fetched. The scarometer is giving it a 3.2. Ooh, that's scarier than dinner with that side of the family you don't much like. Story 5. Girl babysitting late at night. She sees a dude outside of the sliding glass door and calls the cops. The cops come and see that there are muddy footprints inside the house. The dude wasn't outside, he was inside. What the babysitter saw was his reflection. Shudder. Story 6. I knew a girl who said that while home alone, she heard a tapping sound on the floor of her kitchen coming from the basement. She worried it might be a pipe leaking, so she used her house phone to call her dad, and he tells her not to worry about it. After hanging up on the house phone, her cell phone immediately rings. It's her dad telling her to call the cops and get the F out, because he heard someone breathing on the other end of the line. She gets out of the house and calls the cops. The cops show up, search the house, and find some psycho in the basement with a machete. Apparently, he had been tapping it against the basement ceiling in an attempt to lure her downstairs. If she'd gone down into that basement, she probably would have never come back up. Well, on the bright side, I thought you said mustache for some reason. Story 7. 
First off, my mother was one of ten children. When she was a teen, her parents and half her siblings moved to the east. My aunts and uncles have told me that something was strange around that house. They would hear voices running upstairs when no one was there, a rocking chair would rock when no one was in it, and so on. Eventually, my grandmother was diagnosed with brain cancer. She was in her bed at home recuperating from her most recent surgery, and my aunt was there alone taking care of her. My grandmother was completely bedbound at this point. It was impossible for her to walk. She had a funny tendency to blot at her healing incisions on her scalp with tissues, which is kind of not so great for them. Because of this, the tissue box was kept across the room from her. My aunt brought in my grandmother's lunch on a tray and set it down on my grandmother's lap. My grandmother asked her for the tissues for her head, and my aunt reminded her that she was not supposed to do that. My grandmother then asked for a drink. My aunt went to the kitchen and brought back her drink when she saw her mother with the tissues still in bed blotting her head. My aunt takes them away and again reminds her that she shouldn't do that. This is when she realizes that my grandmother cannot get out of bed, so she asks, Mom, how did you even get these? My grandmother replied, Oh, that little girl that always follows you around gave them to me. Oh, see, this sounds like the first act of a movie about a haunting. This is that moment when things just start to get creepy, but now I'm sitting here like, okay, so uh, when does it get scary? Maybe I'm just jaded, but I really do want a good scare from one of these. 3.5, scarier than a haircut with a new stylist. Story 8. Father, I had a bad dream. You take a sip of vodka and roll over. You stare at the clock tower on Sobonyara Square at 3.23. Go back to sleep. There's work tomorrow. No, father. The familiar warm buzz of vodka starts to sink in. You can barely make out your daughter's pale form in the darkness. Why is that, Devochka Moya? Because in my dream when I was about to go back to sleep, the thing wearing mother's skin sat up. You pause and face your daughter and look at her intensely. The figure behind you begins to stir. Don't talk that way about your brother. It's not his fault we have no money for coats. Such is life in Moscow. This was so unexpected and hilarious. Well done. Story 9. My ex-wife told me this one. Apparently her father, who worked for the Catholic Church, was called in to view the crime scene before the police. So there was this mentally handicapped kid who used to help out at the church, helping the priest and whatever. The priest was murdered one night when just him and the kid were at the church. Apparently the priest's body was quite mutilated. Bloody footprints were found walking across the floor, up the wall, across the cathedral ceiling, then back down the other wall. They found the kid cowering in a corner of the church. Story 10. So back in the 1970s, my mom was a teenager living in Houston. She and her nine siblings lived in the Heights, which she says is a nice neighborhood now, but at the time was something of a slum. Her family was super, super poor. Anyway, my mom had a crush on one of her brother's friends. She was around 14 or 15 at the time. He was a few years older, but she was in love. His name was Mark. Well, around this time, boys started disappearing from the neighborhood. They weren't leaving notes or telling anyone that they were leaving. The families were calling the police, but the police weren't doing anything about it. They decided that the boys had run away and never really looked into it further. After all, these were poor kids living in a bad neighborhood. They ran away all the time. Life goes on. One day, Mark disappears too. Meanwhile, my mom's younger brother is hitching a ride out to the beach to go fishing. He did this on a regular basis and would bum a ride from anyone. On the way to the beach, the guy driving the car stops to fill up the gas tank. The guy working at the gas station, mom says they called him Weird Larry, sees my uncle and asks who he's with. My uncle replies that he doesn't actually know the guy. Larry won't let my uncle go any further and makes him get out of the car. The driver goes on without him. Now then, three years have passed since boys started disappearing and they finally find out what happened. A man had been paying two boys to lure teenage boys to his house where he drugged them, strapped them to a wooden board, tortured them, violated them, and killed them. There were at least 28 victims, and Mark Scott was one of them. The only reason they found out was because the two teenagers murdered the serial killer, then told the police about all the murders and led them to some of the bodies. And guess who picked up my uncle that day he was going fishing? Okay, this is genuinely scary, but mostly because it also just sounds like a true story, so no goofy rating for this. Just me feeling even more worried about strangers than I usually do. Story 11. There was this one R.L. Stein story that always freaked me out. I'll make up names and try to tell the gist of it. There was this kid, Jerry, who had to go to the hospital to have his tonsils out, so he's staying in a room with a few other beds. 
There's a kid in the bed next to him called Ben, except whenever someone calls him by his name, he says, I'm not Ben. Ben's mom tells Jerry it's because Ben has to have his leg amputated and he does not want to lose it. The night of Ben's surgery, the nurse comes in to wheel Ben to the operating room, but they approach Jerry's bed. Ah, the chart here says Ben, says the nurse, and they start wheeling off Jerry. Jerry says, but I'm not Ben. The nurse then says to the other, oh, he always says that apparently. Jerry then looks over to Ben's bed where Ben is sitting smiling. And then they both went out for ice cream. Super chilling story, but I couldn't get over the name choice. Story 12. Did anyone read the article about the girl who called her mom while she was being eaten alive by a bear? That was scary not only because being eaten by a bear sounds terrifying, but also because it would be horrifying to get a call from your daughter screaming for help and there is nothing you can do. There was a woman in my hometown that was talking to her daughter as the daughter was driving. They got into a huge argument and the girl flipped her car. The mother heard her daughter die. That one messed with me for a while. A girl in her teens gets called upon to babysit some kids on a Friday evening. Apparently, she watches those two girls pretty regularly. Anyway, the parents left for the evening and said they wouldn't be home until around midnight. The teenager puts the two young girls to bed around 9 p.m. She does what most people would do, goes downstairs and watches TV for a while. She watches TV for an hour or so, and by this point, it's getting pretty late. She's in the living room on the main level. The TV sits in the corner of the room with a large window on each side of it. Suddenly, out of the corner of her eye, sees what she thinks is someone walking by the window outside through the bushes. Naturally, she gets pretty freaked out. She ends up calling 911 and the police arrive. The police check outside and don't find any signs of anyone walking around. I guess it was winter with snow on the ground. The police officers assure her she's safe and that the lighting from the both the TV and lamp probably played tricks on her by reflecting off the window. The teen agrees that's probably what it was, yet asks them to check inside the house for her just to be safe. The police reluctantly oblige and start randomly checking rooms, closets, and the garage a bit haphazardly. They roll their eyes a bit as they wonder how much this girl's imagination has run wild. Well, it turns out they find a man hiding underneath one of the little girl's beds. I guess as the story goes, it was the little girl's mother's ex-husband. The babysitter didn't see someone walk past the window outside. What she saw was the reflection of him walking behind the couch. I thought this was going to be that stupid story about the clown statue that you see every two seconds on Facebook. Okay, first, I have no idea what the clown statue story is, but I also don't go on Facebook, so thank heavens for that. Second, do we want to start taking bets on how many of these stories are going to reuse the The creeper wasn't outside the window, it was their reflection from inside! Because I've seen that on two different stories before this thread, and I have a feeling we will see it again. Story 14 a man is driving a regular route along the highway when he notices a turnoff that will take him up through the mountains. He figures he drives this way all the time, but has never taken the mountain path, even though it will only take him a few hours longer to reach his destination. As a spur-of-the-moment decision, he takes the turn and begins his journey up the winding road. He'd started his drive later in the day than usual, so the sky is getting dark as he approaches the top, but the view is gorgeous. While he continues, he gets a small chill up the base of his neck, but dismisses it as the cool mountain air. Not long after, he has to slow his car as he approaches what appears to be a nasty car accident. Two cars completely totaled, looking like they hit each other head-on just after rounding a corner. The man can see a few bodies on the ground, all bloodied and not moving. Immediately, he knows he has to pull over and help, but he can't stop some sixth sense telling him something about the scene is wrong. Like, it isn't natural. He decides he's going to drive his car forward and park it just beyond the crash site before getting out to help. He slowly creeps by the wreck and manages a better look at the bodies. It's definitely human, but something seems amiss, but he still can't place it. He rolls the car forward maybe six meters from the crash site as he's about to come to a stop and opens his door to investigate. He looks out to his front windshield for a moment. It's gotten terribly dark now, nearly pitch black, when something in his rearview mirror catches his eye. Several things, in fact. As he gazes into the mirror in horror, he can see the bodies of the crash site illuminated by his rear lights. All of them are sitting up, staring directly at his car, eyes glowing like orbs in the mirror. He panics and suddenly more people come out from the dishes and forests surrounding the road, but only when the crash victim's bodies begin to stand, seemingly fine, no limps or dragging themselves, does he have the presence of mind to throw the car back into drive. 
By the time the first people are taking careful steps toward the vehicle, he's already speeding as fast as he can around the bend and getting the heck off the mountain. Nothing ever came for him, nor did it seem he was ever followed. Sometimes he wonders if his mind played a trick on him, but he's still to this day, he always checks his rearview mirror before ever stepping out of the car. I'm being told this story was told on the Rooster Teeth podcast forever ago. I don't listen to them, but my friend who told me this story does, so probably not a coincidence. Said they read it online, but probably forgot the source. Some users have also pointed out that this is similar to a story posted itself some time ago. My bad, sorry. Yeah, I was actually about to say that I remember hearing this on the Rooster Teeth podcast, back when Rooster Teeth was a company that had more going for it than Funhouse and a bunch of allegations against them of terrible working conditions. Working there is apparently the real scary story. Story 15. I remember the poster who was out hunting alone and was being stalked the entire time by a man with his dog before he spotted them one night, and was warned to leave. Creepy crap. Story 16. All right, figured I'd share one of my own. The story was told to me by my great aunt, one of my grandmother's nine sisters. In Cuba, where we're all from, the summers tend to get hot. Coupled with a lack of air conditioning, you'd have to be wealthy to own a unit, people tend to sleep with the doors and windows open. One night, my Aunt T was putting her grandchildren to sleep. She laid in bed with them, and they were alone in the home. One of her sisters, Berto, was supposed to be keeping them company tonight, but some last-minute event made her change where she slept that night. My Aunt T says that sometime around 9 p.m. she noticed a figure who, by her description, must have been seven feet down. It was human-shaped but seemed to float inside their home. If it had legs, they weren't visible because a long robe of some sort covered them and dragged along her floor. At this point, rather than scream in fear, my Aunt T decides to lay perfectly still so as not to wake the children. She sees the figure cross the hallway and head into her room, looming ominously over them. The face, she described, was that of a pale woman with big red lips and her hair in dreads like that of a Rastafarian man. There were just shadows, cavities as she called it, where her eyes would have been. It left her room through the same way it entered, but didn't leave. My aunt's house is large, and she swears she saw the figure go in and out of each room, take about the same amount of time, then leave. Eventually, she ran out of places to visit and simply glided out the front door. My aunt cries to this very day because the next morning, her sister Berta was found dead. Everyone thought it must have been some sort of heart attack or stroke in her sleep because no one heard anything, and they found her where she laid the night before, only lifeless. My aunt swears the thing must have been death itself, searching for her sister where she should have been. Story 17. My cousin was in a band and did some touring for a while. He ran into another band from the Illinois area that had a creepy story to tell. They spent their days on the road and didn't make a lot of money, so they always depended on fans to find places to stay. After playing a show, there was a particular fan who seemed really interested. He offered them a place to stay. His parents were really involved in their church and absent from the house. The band members were kind of curious about this, so they asked him if his parents were on a mission. He just kind of awkwardly smiled and didn't answer the question. Later that night, the band members were getting hungry and thought about raiding the guy's fridge. However, they decided since he was being such a good host that they didn't want to be rude. A few days later, they saw a story on the news about a guy who killed his parents, chopped them up, and put them in his freezer. The guy who was arrested under suspicion was the guy they had stayed with. His parents were in the freezer when they talked about raiding the fridge. Let's see what this guy has to eat. Hmm, pot pies, pizza rolls, some old folks. Oh my god, ham and cheese lean pockets? We gotta get out of here. This guy is a freak. Story 18. Last year I worked with a guy who'd spend some time on oil rigs in the North Sea. He told me that there was a really huge storm which pounded the crap out of the place that happened all the time there. In the morning, they had to assess the damage, and they saw that there's this platform down by the water that was particularly submerged. Normally, it's just above the water line. So, being a low guy on the totem pole, he went down first, and he told me that the whole thing was a death trap, the platform barely hanging on. He told me that he got to the bottom where the rest was in the water, and just as soon as he stepped into the water, it started sinking fast. He had to run up the stairs, and when he got to the landing above, the whole thing under him just broke off and sank. But what got me is when he said that it wasn't like it just sank, it was like the metal was pulled until it broke. Like something big grabbed it from underneath and pulled it down. 
and whatever it was only did that when he stepped into that water, like it had been a trap. He told me after that they kept getting damage they couldn't explain, metal ladders broke and pipes sheared off, always during storms. Sometimes guys went missing, which was the worst. He told me that they told the media that they had to evacuate the place because of some kind of leak, but that was the real reason, and eventually the whole place was going to go down. And he said the same thing had happened to other places in the North Sea. Frick if I know if he was lying, but I thought it was creepy. This may actually be my fave from the whole thread. The ocean is creepy stuff. The scariest part for me was starting every other sentence with the words he told me. Oh, I'm kidding. It wasn't scary, but the ocean is, and that is a decently creepy story. 4 out of 10, scarier than eating at Jack in the Box after 1am. Please like and subscribe if you've made it this far. I hope you'll enjoy the rest of the video and have a wonderful day. Story 19. You are home to watch Pravda on Televizir about degenerate murderer who is on the loose. You look out the window door to the beet field and you notice man standing in the snow. He looks like a photo on television and he smiles at you. You gulp vodka, picking up the phone to your right and dialing local militia precinct commissar. Back out the glass you look, pressing the phone to ear. Notice he is now closer to you. You drop vodka in shock. No footprints in snow. It was a reflection. You dullard. Your apartment is bulldozed down to make way for a glorious tractor field. Be liking if you are the crying all of time. Story 20. This is a true story. My grandfather, roughly 15 years ago, once woke my grandmother up at 4 a.m. with no shoes and bloodied feet. Naturally, she asked him what had happened. He was very confused and could not really comprehend what happened to him. What he told my grandmother frightened her so terribly. He said he was woken up at about 12 a.m. at night by a bright light and strange noises. The next thing he knew, he was in a small town about five miles from his house. He walked home disoriented, barefoot for those five miles in the cold winter. His feet were cold and numb and bloody. My grandmother asked who took him away. He could not answer. His mind froze up. Still haunts the crap out of me not knowing what happened. 12 p.m. is noon, dude. Story 21. I'm a camp counselor, and I told a variation of the Slender Man story where he is a traditional fae that followed colonists to the New World and went insane and started killing people by stalking the naughty children who stayed out late. Oh, and by the way, my gimmick as a storyteller is that all my stories are true, and I worked up to this story over four weeks, starting with Tame Crap, and I ended with that. All my campers were crying, as were some of my coworkers. I scared myself so much that I refused to leave my cabin after full dark for the remaining three days I was there. When I was a camp counselor, we would tell the girls a ghost story about a woman the camp was named after, whose grave was on sight. She died when she and her horse ran off a cliff on the grounds. Then a few days later, one of us would dress up in a sheet and ride one of our white horses at a gallop past all the campsites. Too long didn't read, all camp counselors are evil. Apparently, all camp counselors also don't know how to tell their friggin' stories, just how to tell people that they know how to tell stories. OP, I know you said you built up to it over four weeks or whatever, but come on, give us more than a few lazy sentences or don't bother. Story 22. Forgive me if I get this wrong, it is a true story I read a while ago that made my blood run cold. A poster was remembering her childhood. She and her brother were playing in the home, her mother and aunt in the kitchen making lunch. As the kids were running around the house playing, the girl sees an old woman sitting in the living room. The old woman looks up at the girl and smiles, and the girl can still hear her mother in the kitchen, her brother playing outside. The old woman, still smiling, beckons the girl over to her chair and says, Sweetie, your mother is very tired of taking care of you. She is tired and sick of having you around the house. Nobody here wants or loves you, and you have to come with me. You are going to live with me now. The old woman reaches out to grab the girl's arm when the mother calls from the kitchen. The girl runs into the kitchen and tells her mom in tears about the old woman in the living room. They go and look, and the woman is gone. Those social workers are crafty mother effers. Story 23. My buddy told me this one the other day. So his sister had three friends who went down to Mexico for a fun week of drinking slash vacation fun. They were at a bar a night or so before they were supposed to leave, having a good time, and it turns out their friend just up and disappeared. Her phone was unresponsive, and she had completely vanished from the bar. Well, they were all crap-faced at the time, so the two friends just assumed she had gone back to the hotel or had ended up with some hot guy or something somewhere. Turns out she wasn't at the hotel. 
After a lot of commotion, they were driving back towards the U.S. when they were elated to see their friend sitting in a car with a few Mexican gentlemen a lane or so behind them. Strangely, all efforts to contact her are in vain. Waving, screaming, and making any kind of commotion ends up with absolutely zero response from her. They alert the Border Patrol that their friend who had been missing was spotted in a car along the highway. The Border Patrol stops the car and investigates. As it turns out, there was a pretty good reason why their friend wasn't acknowledging their presence. Their friend was dead. But not only were they communicating with their friend's dead corpse, her organs had been completely removed from her body and she had been stuffed to the brim with drugs. Dead, organs gone, stuffed with drugs. I was pretty fricked up after hearing that part to pry about what happened afterwards, but the image of her friend trying to communicate with her friend's dead body, their same friend they just partied with the night before, chills me to the bone. Story 24. There was a young man named Tom who didn't exactly have the best home life. Every night, Tom went to sleep buried under the covers trying to silence all the noise. Every night, there were arguments. Even with all his blankets on, Tom could still hear them as clear as day. They always got louder and louder, so even if Tom was lucky enough to fall asleep before it started, it was guaranteed he would be woken up. The only thing he could do was lie there and pretend to be asleep. Sometimes he heard slapping or hitting. Best to stay quiet, though. No need to get involved. Some nights she would come into Tom's room and sit in the chair by his bed. She would sit there for hours and just sob. Tom didn't know if the yelling or sobbing was worse. He just wanted to escape. But Tom couldn't escape. It was the only place he could afford. Although he lived alone, he knew he was never alone. Then it turned out he was in a mental hospital. Then it turned out his doctor was imagining him. Then it turned out the doctor was actually an alien. Then it turned out that the aliens were actually Americans and were the real invaders. I'm glad the commenters all found that ending as expected and cliched as I did. The moment I read there were arguments, I thought, yeah, between the ghosts, right? 2.2 .2 out of 10, lack of sleep is a little scary. Story 25. I remember reading a creepypasta about this guy on a train. He takes the same train slash bus every day, and he begins to notice the strange man who just rides the train and never seems to leave, and who no one seems to notice. So eventually he ends up following this man all the way to the end of the train stop at the end of the day. He follows him into an old sort of train tunnel slash subway system and ends up losing him and getting lost himself. He manages to get back to the surface only to realize he's not in his own dimension anymore. And the only way he can get back or move to another dimension is by getting someone to follow him into the train tunnel slash system. Only because these people slash beings look so different, he has to sit perfectly still till they almost cannot even see him. So he sits on the train day after day till someone eventually notices and starts to follow him. And if anyone can find that story again, that would be amazing. It was a great read. Story 26. A comment I saw in an Ask thread similar to this one, Too Long Didn't Read, a poster's friend was going out for the night and realized she forgot her wallet slash ID. So she goes back for it, leaving the lights off because she knew where it was in her room. When she got back, the writing on the wall was, thanks for not turning on the light in lipstick. And her laptop, iPod, etc. had been stolen. <laughs> what? Did I just have a minor stroke in the middle of that story? Oh, wait, okay, I put it together. It was just paced out as fast as a guy his first time having intercourse over before it really started. Story 27. Not a very good writer or storyteller, but this one happened in Iraq. A member of my squad, a fairly odd individual who will be named X, started complaining one week that he kept seeing something through his NVGs while on night patrols in the city. He wasn't sure what it was, but it wasn't a human or anything, so it raised no suspicion, and we thought, Oh, that's just X being X and laughed it off. A few days go by and another night patrol. He can't sleep and is sweating and freaking the freak out. We all ask him, dude, what's going on? You all right? His response was, death is following me. He claimed to be able to see a shadowy figure floating from rooftop to rooftop following our patrol. He was only visible through NVGs and not by streetlights or anything. If you've ever been to Iraq and use NVGs and just watch the sky, sometimes there would always be weird flashes and crap with no explanation, but we figured it was satellites or drones or some crap. He was dead serious about it, but again, we just thought that's X being X and laughed it off. The very next day, X was killed in action. Freaked the frick out of my whole platoon, and we really don't know what to make of it. Story 28 
a one-off fictional TV docudrama called Threads. It was made back in the 1980s and showed what would happen if a nuclear bomb was detonated over Sheffield. It showed the aftermath of the first few days and the months and years thereafter. That crap scared the bejesus out of me when I watched it two weeks ago and still does when I think about the impact that it can cause. Story 29. It has been reported that some victims of debauchery during the act would retreat into a fantasy world from which they could not wake up. In this catatonic state, the victim lived in a world just like their normal one, except they weren't being violated. The only way that they realized they needed to wake up was a note they found in their fantasy world. It would tell them about their condition and tell them to wake up. Even then, it would often take months until they were ready to discard their fantasy world and please wake up. Damn it, I thought I was just sitting here at work and it turns out I'm being violated. Not sure which is worse. Story 30. I'm probably a little late to this conversation, but I think maybe in 2005 or so there was a thread on some camera slash photography forum that a guy found a camera in the woods while hiking with his buddies. Took a look at the pictures after he got back and it had the creepiest pictures. An abandoned radio tower, pictures of mirrors with weird reflections, foggy woods, etc. Almost Blair Witch-like. It was a very intense thread. I'm getting chills just typing this. For the life of me, I can't find it anymore, but I trust that some people know what I'm talking about. Hopefully. I don't, but I get you. Radio towers and fog? I'm chilled to my very bones! Oh, one sec, let me grab a blanket. Ah, much better. Okay, until I see those pictures, 0.5 out of 10, as scary as a pleasant cat. Story 31. You get a phone call from your mother. Since her car has been in the shop, she asks you to go to the grocery store and pick up a few odds and ends for her. Bread, milk, cereal, and chicken breasts. After writing down a small list, you reluctantly get in the car and pick up the items at the store. The lady cashier makes an odd remark to you. You know, we're in no danger of a milk shortage. Upon arriving at her house, you knock several times. No answer. You decide to try the door. It opens. You place the grocery bag on the counter. Strange, there seems to be six other grocery bags, each with identical contents. And a couple of the chicken and milk has gone bad. Mom, you call out, but no answer. You make your way through the kitchen and into the living room. Sitting on the couch with her head cut off and neatly resting on her lap is your mother. Naturally, you call the police who come over to investigate. They mention that she has been dead for nearly a week. Furthermore, the police psychiatrist is at the scene and talks to you after you give your initial statement. Sitting on the front steps, you overhear the psychiatrist talking with the crime scene investigator. It's not uncommon for people suffering from schizophrenia to get locked into a series of repetitive behaviors, he says. You think to yourself, they can't be talking about me. Schizophrenia? Nah. Repetitive behavior? Did they think I did this? Suddenly, your cell phone goes off. Hello? Hi, hun, it's me. Could you stop at the store and pick up some chicken and milk? Oh, and I need some bread and cereal, too. No problem, Mom. I'll be right over. Story 32. A young boy is sitting in a class when he notices a girl of about the same age out the window and across the street. She smiles and holds up a hand, giving him the peace sign. The next time he looks, she's gone, but it looks like she dropped something. At recess, he crosses the street to where she was and finds a Polaroid picture of the girl holding up her two fingers like before. He can't get her off his mind for the rest of the day. There's something just a little bit off about the way she looked at him. That night, the boy wakes up to a sound outside his window. When he looks out, he sees the girl again, smiling strangely and holding up two fingers. He climbs out the window and begins to follow her. As he's crossing the street to where she's standing, a car crests the hill and strikes him, killing him instantly. The driver, distraught, jumps out of his car and finds the boy already dead. In his hand, the boy is clutching a photograph of a young girl smiling strangely and holding up three fingers. This one wasn't really scary, but I do like it. I like sinister little twists and stories like this and creepy little girls being evil. Story 33. The scariest story I read was called 1408, written by Stephen King. It's a short story about a paranormal investigator who tries to spend the night in a haunted hotel room and goes mental. They made it into a film, but it wasn't very good. Story 34. I'm giving credit to Cracked.com for this one. When I read it, it horrified me, and I proceeded to research every little thing I could regarding it. I have no answers. Nobody has any answers. The Valentich disappearance history has seen its fair share of aircraft and even boats disappear into the great abyss that is our mighty oceans. So it wouldn't be surprising to hear that on October 21st, 1978, 
a Cessna 182 light aircraft piloted by Australian Frederick Valentich pulled a Houdini and disappeared right the frick out of thin air. That is, until you see his last radio transmissions, which will be the creepiest thing you'll ever read. Valentich. Melbourne, this is Delta Sierra Juliet. Are there any known aircraft below 5,000? Melbourne, no known traffic. Valentich. I am... seems to be a large aircraft below 5,000. Melbourne. What type of aircraft is it? Valentich. I cannot affirm. There are four bright lights. Seems like landing lights. Valentich claimed the aircraft was zipping past, getting too close, and going incredibly fast. At one point, Valentich said the aircraft stopped in mid-air, and he orbited around to get a better look at it. Valentich. It's got a green light and sort of metallic-like. It's all shiny on the outside. It just vanished. Later, Valentich. Melbourne, that strange aircraft is hovering on top of me again. It's hovering, and it's not an aircraft. That was Valentich's last transmission. What followed was 17 seconds of what sounded like metallic scraping. Neither he or his aircraft have ever been found. See, creepy unsolved mysteries. Now that's what I'm talking about. 5.7 out of 10. I got little chills wondering just what this guy saw and knowing his actual words. <laughs> Story 35. Since I was about five, every few years or so, I see the same person in my dreams. It is genderless, has pale skin, long black hair. Typical ring girl look-alike, but the first time I saw it, I was five, which was 1996, and ring girl didn't exist. Anyway, sometimes it will be in the background of my dreams, sometimes I'll be having a regular dream and then I get a distinct feeling that it is being interrupted and I have a brief dream where this genderless entity is staring at me, then I go back to my regular dream. The worst one was a dream where I was being chased by it, finally ended up crouched down in the kitchen of a house made entirely of glass. It found me, obviously, picked me up and started shaking me as the room spun around and around. All I remember is the room going around us in a blur as if we were standing still, and it, the entity, was just staring at me. We didn't break eye contact until I woke up. But I woke up because I couldn't breathe. I felt like a five-ton weight was on my whole body. I was lying on my back. I never, ever sleep on my back. Then the weight started lifting as if someone had been lying on top of me and started to get up. Last time I saw in my dreams was about three years ago. I don't think I've gone much longer than that without seeing it, so I'm afraid I'm due for a visit soon. Story 36. The creepiest story I was ever told was about the mouth of Heck in Russia. A teacher told us this story, since proved to be fake by some journalists, that a mining team in Russia dug an incredibly deep shaft into the Earth's crust and had to stop. They stopped because they dropped recording equipment into the hole and heard human screams of torment. Yeah, this story goes on to postulate that they dug up a tunnel right to the roof or back entrance of Heck. Totally bogus, but as a 13-year-old, it was really creepy. That story and that one movie where the toys come to life and try to kill the neighborhood. My five-year-old self couldn't sleep for weeks after that one. Story 37. Our slash no sleep always has promising stories. My personal favorites are stories like Life Inside the Machine, Butcher Face, The Rake, and quite a few others. Take a look for yourself. No. I will not. I am here. Tell me stories. Story 38. My favorite is the shortest horror story ever told. The last man in the world is sitting alone reading a book. Then there's a knock on the door. Story 39. House of Leaves. God dang, that book scared the crap out of me. Story 40. The letter Albert Fish sent to the parents of the young girl he ate. Dear Mrs. Budd, in 1894, a friend of mine shipped as a deckhand on the steamer Tacoma, Captain John Davis. They sailed from San Francisco for Hong Kong, China. On arriving there, he and two others went ashore and got drunk. When they returned, the boat was gone. At that time, there was famine in China. Meat of any kind was from one to three dollars per pound. So great was the suffering among the very poor that old children under twelve were sold for food in order to keep others from starving. A boy or girl under 14 was not safe in the street. You could go in any shop and ask for steak chops or stew meat. Part of the naked body of a boy or girl would be brought out and just what you wanted cut from it. A boy or girl's behind, which is the sweetest part of the body, and sold as veal cutlet bought the highest price. John stayed there so long he acquired a taste for human flesh. On his return to New York, he stole two boys, one seven and one eleven. 
took them to his home, stripped them naked, tied them in a closet, then burned everything they had. Several times every day and night he spanked them, tortured them to make their meat good and tender. First he killed the eleven-year-old boy because he had the fattest butt and, of course, the most meat on it. Every part of his body was cooked and eaten except the head bones and guts. He was roasted in the oven, all of his butt, boiled, broiled, fried, and stewed. The little boy was next and went the same way. At that time, I was living at 409 East 100th Street, near right side. He told me so often how good human flesh was. I made up my mind to taste it. On Sunday, June the 3rd, 1928, I called on you at 406 West 15th Street, brought you pot cheese strawberries. We had lunch. Grace sat in my lap and kissed me. I made up my mind to eat her. On the pretense of taking her to a party, you said yes, she could go. I took her to an empty house in Westchester I had already picked out. When we got there, I told her to remain outside. She picked wildflowers, I went upstairs and stripped all my clothes off. I knew if I did not, I would get her blood on them. When all was ready, I went to the window and called her. Then I hid in a closet until she was in the room. When she saw me all naked, she began to cry and tried to run down the stairs. I grabbed her and she said she would tell her mama. First, I stripped her naked, how she did kick, bite, and scratch. I choked her to death, then cut her in small pieces so I could take my meat to my rooms, cook, and eat it. How sweet and tender her little butt was roasted in the oven. It took me nine days to eat her entire body. I did not frick her, though I could have had I wished. She died a virgin. Well, it scares me just how awful and monstrous human beings can be, and frankly, this just makes me sad. How that could be done to children is, frankly, disgusting. Story 41. A young girl named Lisa was left alone on several accounts as her parents worked late. Her parents bought her a dog to keep her company. One night Lisa was awoken by a constant dripping sound. She got up and went to the kitchen to turn off the tap properly. As she was getting back into the bed, she stuck her hand under the bed and the dog licked it. The dripping sound continued, so she went to the bathroom and turned off the tap properly in there, too. She went back to her bedroom and stuck her hand under the bed, and the dog licked it again. But the dripping continued, so she went outside and turned off the taps out there. She came back to bed, stuck her hand under it, and the dog licked it again. The dripping continued, drip, drip, drip. This time she listened and located the source of the dripping. It was coming from her cupboard. She opened the cupboard door, and there was her dog hanging upside down with its skin peeled off, and writing on the window in blood was, Humans can lick hands, too. Well, you couldn't have more obviously telegraphed that twist ending if you had put it in neon lights. I might have been scared had I not just been too busy being mad that I knew the entire time your story would involve killing the dog. Fart sound to you, OP. Fart sound. Story 42. Legend goes like this. You enter the bathroom and stand in front of the mirror, turning candles off, and while being in front of the mirror, spinning rapidly, you chant Leon Trotsky, Leon Trotsky, Leon Trotsky, Leon Trotsky several times, while catching glimpses of self on mirror. It is said that eventually you will see the image of Leon Trotsky in the mirror. Upon exiting the bathroom, you are being arrested by KGB for believing in the existence of Leon Trotsky whom the party has proven never existed. Story 43. This happened when I was four, so it is scary to me that I was sleeping in the house when it happened. It was late. My sister and I had long gone to sleep. My mom was in the bathroom washing up when she heard a noise. She looks over and there's a guy staring in the bathroom window, just staring. She screams. Fortunately, her boyfriend lived next door at the time. He hears the screaming and comes running over. The guy is long gone, and in the post-scariest frick stress, my mom begins to wonder if it hadn't happened. Two days later, the guy was picked up for brutally assaulting and aring a woman. Story 44 I can't say it is the scariest story, but what gets me about this is that it is recent and real. It isn't no sleep status, but I'll tell you as best I can. I go to a nice Catholic church with my parents on occasion. They enjoyed the early mass, so I went to the 7 o'clock service. I've known the priest for quite some time and am on a personal basis with him, even though I no longer am a regular. I was shooting the crap with the priest as he was saying goodbye to families and preparing for the next service. He normally asks how you are, etc. One such couple he did not recognize, so he talked to them as I stood by. 
He asked who they were and how they were doing. With the saddest look of fighting to keep tears back, she informed us of their situation. Their son was recently killed in the Aurora shootings. This was but the day after, and our whole town was still in shock. He went aside with them, and so I left, bummed out about the situation. I come back a week later and talked with the priest. He helped the family through the process of losing their son slash funeral slash emotions. He also had to bless their son before taking him to the mortuary. The parents were advised that no matter how hard it was to not see their son for the last time, that they should avoid it. He was shot in the head. The priest told me that when he went to bless the body, nothing was really done, not that anything could be done. Brain matter, blood, the lack of half a face. He said a final goodbye to the son for the parents, blessed him, and left. It isn't necessarily a scary story, but the look in the priest's eyes scared the crap out of me. They went right through me as he explained it. He was still seeing it. I almost felt like I could see it in his eyes. I will never forget that look. Never. While that might not be a scary story in some ways, it is genuinely scary to think about how we can lose people, how little is left of them, how it sticks with us. We've joked a lot, but hey, appreciate the time you have and the people you have it with. Story 45 I had a friend that grew up deep in Appalachia. He once admitted that as a child, he would sometimes look up from his bed at night to see a green face watching him. It would move its mouth like it was saying something, but it was silent. He would always try to convince himself he was dreaming and would rattle off prayers until he fell asleep. It never did anything other than watch him, so he eventually discounted it as a normal phenomenon of dream time. He switched rooms a few times as he got older, and strangely, he'd stop seeing the face. But when he moved back into that room, the face would return. He never told anyone. His family was deeply religious, so he wanted to avoid any freakouts about demons or the devil. After college, he and his brothers were reminiscing, and he finally asked his brother, When you were staying in that room, did you ever see... To which his brother interrupted, A green face? He said he turned white because he'd really convinced himself it wasn't real. Both of them were too nervous to talk about it more except to confirm it was just a green face that watched them and mumbled inaudibly. When they visited home after that, they refused to sleep in that room. There's something super creepy about a disembodied voyeur. Please leave your story in the comments. I would love to make a video on them in the future. Also, don't forget to like and subscribe.